Good morning. My name is Ed. I'm one of your hosts this week, and we welcome you to New York. Our first speaker is our keynote speaker, is Jacob Frank. He's a professor of biochemistry and molecular biophysics and biological sciences at Columbia University. He's also a distinguished professor at SUNY. He has a couple of fields of special specialization, including the application of EM and image analysis, still elucidation <coughs> of 3D structure, and functional macromolecule assemblies and cellular components, as well as the mechanism of protein synthesis. You may know him from his 2014 award, which is the Franklin Medal for Life Science, or the 2017 Wiley Prize in Biomedical Science, or the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, where he shared it with Richard Henderson, Jacques Boucher for developing cryo-EM for high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. Overall, Joachim's been a very big proponent of science education. He's been part of the inter -EM course here at NYSBC for basically a decade and a half. He also has written some of the foundational algorithms for image processing that has developed into the maximum likelihood methods adopted today. Uh, and without further ado, I'll give you the floor, Joachim. Hey, thank you very much, um, Ed, for this very nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> uh, can you just confirm how, how much time I have? Uh, because uh, it, the initial allotment was starting at 10 past 10. Uh, and uh, is this? Uh, uh, it'll be from 9.30 East Coast time to uh, 10.15. Oh, OK, thank you. <clears throat> Um, so, <clears throat> thanks very much for the nice introduction. Um, so the last time I was there in person was exactly two years ago. Um, and uh, there was uh, already a pretty, pretty big panic around. And uh, so we already kept our distance. Um, <clears throat> so today, uh, I just wanted to give you a general flavor of single particle cryo EM. Uh, as you know, meanwhile, the literature is vast uh, and also there are so many results. Uh, this is just the, uh, a screenshot um, uh, of um, uh, PDP um, <clears throat> structures that have been solved, but uh, there are many more. Um, and before I start, I really wanted to um, say that uh, we are all uh, feeling the anguish uh, about what is going on right now in Europe. And uh, right uh, a couple of blocks from me, the Upper West Side, there's this uh, um, statue of Eleanor Roosevelt, and uh, somebody has placed an, uh, a bouquet. <clears throat> Uh, on her arms. <clears throat> um, as you know, I, I was very lucky to get the Nobel Prize in 2017 in chemistry, um, uh, along with Jack de Boucher and Richard Henderson. And so uh, I just wanted to um, draw your attention for the particular citation for developing cryo-electron microscopy for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. Uh, well, the important thing here is to uh, see that this is in solution. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what we really want to uh, have is um, a, a lot of information directly in the cell um, and um, we want to know how molecules interact in the cell to essentially constitute <clears throat> life. Um, and that is unfortunately very difficult because uh, everything is packed in a packed environment. So instead, we are looking at molecules in solution. And what, what this error means is that we are practicing reductionism. Um, we don't, uh, we sort of give up uh, seeing it all in context, at least initially, and we just look at systems in which molecules either either um, display their structure or 
display their dynamic features in uh, interaction with one another. And uh, <clears throat> here's the transmission electron microscope. Uh, the transmission means that the image is formed uh, from electrons that have penetrated the sample. So there are all kinds of electron microscopes and some of them uh, operate on the basis of spec backscattering electrons. So these are electrons that uh, go in the opposite direction after they go onto the specimen. Uh, so, so the transmission means images formed from electrons have penetrated the sample. Uh, just a quick look here, there's a high voltage source, there's an electron gun, um, and then an anode uh, quickly following. Uh, and so the electrons are accelerated uh, to a very high uh, speed, uh, 200, 200 or uh, 300 kilovolts, and then they fly freely um, through uh, the, the central uh, column. Uh, and that is all under high vacuum because if it if it were air, then the electrons would be absorbed within a very small distance, within millimeters or so. Um, and then here is the illumination system. Um, it it focuses the, the and collimates the beam, and then um, we have the objective lens and the sample is right here. It is partially even immersed in the objective lens. And the objective lens is the important lens. Uh, it, um, it is, uh, its quality determines the quality of the, uh, of the image. Uh, and then somewhere here an intermediate image is formed and that is then further magnified by the projector lenses. And then in the end, um, we, uh, we have a fluorescent, we used to have a fluorescent screen to directly look at the image. Uh, we used to have plate cameras uh, or film cameras down here. Uh, and uh, maybe somebody would be sitting on the electron microscope and look uh, at the fluorescent screen. This is all abandoned now. Now we have a recording on digital cameras. Uh, then, you know, by the way, the lenses are not glass lenses, they are magnetic lenses. Um, and um, so, okay, so that's the story. Um, <clears throat> now there are three classes of scattering outcomes. Um, <clears throat> one of them is that the uh, electron flies simply through um, and it's, it's un, unimpeded by the, by the specimen. Uh, so we call this unscattered primary. And then what can happen is that an electron uh, it <coughs> collides uh, with, uh, with some of the electrons of the atoms and then this, it produces a variety of actions, in, including ejection of secondary electrons, X-ray, is um, orbital, orbital jumps, and uh, but um, in a summary, these are all uh, called inelastic scattered uh, primaries. Uh, inelastic scattering means that they have lost energy, and the important thing is they also lost. Uh, phase coherence. It simply means that they, they no longer are able to interact uh, with the unscattered primary beam. So <clears throat> uh, the real interesting um, uh, scattered electrons are the ones that uh, that are elastically scattered, which means that they, there is no electron, uh, uh, no energy loss involved, and they simply are deflected in some way. And these are the source of high resolution image uh, images. Uh, essentially what, what, what happens is that the forward scattered beam sees the Coulomb potential or the electrostatic potential. So, so all the image formation that we make use of 
uh, comes from elastically scattered electrons. <clears throat> now the object projection you can think of as an integral over the Coulomb potential distribution. And I'm, I'm showing you this picture here because, because it, it is not, uh, when you think about projection, very, very often you think of, of, of an, uh, a, a black and white uh, image, like a shadow or so. Well, this here is really a, a true integral through the entire uh, distribution. <clears throat> And uh, how did the three degree construction of biological molecules started? Um, well, the, the seminal work was by David Dorisier and Aaron Kluge in Nature um, 1968. They um, managed to get the structure of the <coughs> uh, bacteria phage tail, uh, which is a helical structure, uh, has helical symmetry. And uh, the basis of the reconstruction uh, goes back to Johannes Radon, um, a mathematician uh, in, uh, I believe in Austria. And um, he came up with the projection slice theorem, which is also called central slice theorem or Fourier slice theorem. So uh, his, his um, uh, mathematical formalism shows that the, uh, <clears throat> when we look at a projection, um, uh, here is, uh, everything is uh, the relationship between 2D and 1D. So we have a one-dimensional projection of a two-dimensional distribution. And when we look in Fourier space, then this <clears throat> one-dimensional projection forms a one-dimensional central slice uh, through the two-dimensional Fourier transform. Um, okay, you, you see this here. Um, so that immediately suggests that we can um, obtain uh, the entire Fourier transform. Uh, we can sample it by taking projections in all different directions. And then you, we get central slices here uh, that fill the entire angular space. And then by some uh, interpolation schemes, uh, we can fill the entire Fourier space with information, and then we do a, an inverse Fourier transform, and you, we get the uh, we get this back. <clears throat> <clears throat> now um, there are uh, several groups at the at the MRC uh, in Cambridge uh, have have now uh, in, in the uh, close to 1970, have in, in various ways uh, take, taken advantage of this uh, formalism. And uh, as I told you, Derosier and Klug um, uh, <clears throat> got the re uh, reconstruction of this helical structure. Um, and uh, they took advantage of the fact that uh, for a helical structure, uh, a single projection already gives you all the information. So um, any any kind of tilting is 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 not required. Um, another pioneer here is Tony Crowther, and who in 1970 uh, came up with the, with the first um, viral structure, and this has icosahedral symmetry, very high symmetry, which again implies that a single projection already gives you information. Uh, about about the entire angular space, um, and then Henderson and Unwin in 1975 uh, came up with a way of reconstructing a a two dimensional uh, crystal by tilting it in in different uh, in different directions, and each time uh, forming an, an average. <clears throat> now you see what is common among all these uh, contributions. What is common is that the molecule is, is always uh, a part of a, of a crystal. Uh, and uh, what, what, what it implies is um, there is a convenient way of, of uh, retrieving the information and forming averages um, 
but it all goes uh, through uh, different mathematical algorithms. Uh, so they are uh, essentially, you're, you're looking at a different mathematical approaches, different computational approaches, different kinds of software packages. Okay, so, so there is a whole theory of doing helical reconstruction. There's a whole theory of doing these icosahedral or high symmetry reconstruction of viruses and a theory of doing, of doing this. So uh, it is not very general. And uh, so it raises the question, why do we need crystals? Um, because obviously this is just, this, this is dealing just with a subset of, of, <clears throat> of structures. <clears throat> uh, many molecules don't like to be in crystal formation. <clears throat> now, that is a point where I can tell you about the X-ray and the EM roots. So my mentor Hoppe, who was originally an X-ray crystallographer and he turned his attention to electron microscopy in the, in the early 1960s. Um, and so for the, the important for the rapid dissemination of ideas and techniques uh, and also mathematical concepts, um, it were meetings that were co-organized by Walter Hoppe with Max Perutz um, in, in Hirschek and, and Alpbach. Uh, so 1968 was just a year after I, I joined his group. And uh, these meetings brought extra crystallographers together with the early pioneers of electron crystallography. Uh, crystallography because everybody used, um, used the uh, crystal forms. <clears throat> and here's a, a historical site uh, of a 1968 workshop on extra crystallography and EM of proteins. Uh, and among the people who were there, uh, yeah, I was there, and then Harold Erickson, Richard Henderson, Ken Holmes, uh, Hugh Huxley, Nigel Unwin, many others who you now recognize as pioneers in different fields. <clears throat> and uh, well, I, I have to um, remind you that crystals are not good examples of lifelike environments for molecules. They act as energy traps and make me think of ice nine. Uh, has anybody read Kurt Vonnegut's novels? Uh, well, <clears throat> ice nine is a uh, fictitious alternative structure of water in, in his novel, Cat's Cradle. Uh, and that is solid at room temperature. And when a crystal of ice nine contacts liquid water, it acts as a seed crystal that makes the molecules of liquid water arrange themselves into a solid form of lowest energy, namely ice nine. And life ceases under these conditions. And that's also the of unfortunate end uh, of, this, of this novel because it is really the end of life on the planet. <clears throat> And uh, this is a very nice article that um, it, it looks at the at the energy uh, <clears throat> distributions that are important in biology. Life requires a multi multiplicity of states that are accessible at normal temperatures. So if we have something like ice nine or we have an extra crystal, we have a very deep energy trap and uh, the, uh, the molecule never gets out. Uh, so we have here microscopic states, mesoscopic, microscopic states, um, and they're all accessible uh, at, at uh, room temperature. <clears throat> so uh, I, I told you about the uh, <clears throat> question, do we need crystals? Well, we, um, we, can, we can actually do a 3D reconstruction of asymmetrical molecules by, by uh, what's called electron tomography. In electron tomography, we simply have an, uh, <clears throat> an object and then we, we generate a, a whole range of projections uh, by tilting the object uh, around. Uh, and we take as many projections as, as they are required. And then for reconstruction, we do something like that's called back projection, which is essentially in a scheme to 
distribute the information at the right places in the Fourier transform and then do a back, back transform. Um, so we could think he could he thought about doing electron tomography or single molecules. The molecules are simply uh, placed on the on the on the grid, and then we tilt the entire grid around into different angles, um, and and then form a um, a three D reconstruction of the entire uh, arrangement uh, uh, together with the grid, um, and then we carve out. Uh, the, the, the different reconstructions of molecules that are formed in the process. He actually uh, did this for fatty acid synthesis in the ribosome. But the problem is that um, in the process of doing this, in a process of tilting the you know, molecules, uh, you accumulate electron exposure. And, and that exceeds a thousand electrons per angstrom square. It's a huge, huge radiation dodge and um, molecules essentially lose their structure, they collapse, uh, they get denatured. And in the end, uh, you don't you don't see you don't see what, what you are looking for. <clears throat> um, so I pose the same question, but I with, with essentially with this critical view that electron tomography is really not possible. Um, and that's how I came up with the 3D reconstruction of asymmetrical molecules by single particle techniques. And the concept is um, the <clears throat> structural information is, is uh, accumulated from images of single, which means unattached molecules that exist in many copies. The molecules are randomly oriented. And <clears throat> uh, that's means that we don't ever do any tilting because the molecules are already tilted in all the different directions. The molecules are free to assume all naturally occurring conformations. And a single snapshot may already give us hundreds of particle views. And uh, if that's not enough, well, it's normally not enough. We, we um, more and more orientations will be covered until we have enough to re reconstruct the molecule in three dimensions. So where did the idea come? Uh, I already told you it comes from a distrust of electron tomographic approach, which was Walter Hoppe's idea, because the acc accumulation of radiation damage. And this actually was before the dose fractionation concept. Uh, later, on, later on, they did the math and uh, found out that is actually, we can reduce the amount of uh, dose for any single uh, one, but this was not known at that time. Now, the other one is the discovery in my thesis project that successive micrographs of the same area of carbon film can be aligned by cross correlation with high accuracy, better than three angstroms, despite shot noise and build up from, of contamination between exposures. <clears throat> now, at the, at the beginning, uh, this was a complete non idea. People just didn't believe in it. Uh, they thought it was crazy. It was would never work. Why was the idea considered heretic? Well, some people would, were, were saying, is a structure even defined if it's not part of a crystal? What, what, what does structure mean if, if it's not part of the crystal? Uh, so that's where well, was just a very, very narrow way of approaching the solution. And then we have various problems, computational problems. Is it possible to determine the orientations of a molecule with unknown structure from its projections? Um, well, there were solutions that we came up with, uh, this random conical tilt um, <clears throat> idea, uh, which we elaborated. And this was the basis for the first 3D reconstructions. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, the other one is the computational problem number two. Is it possible to sort molecules, images, uh, molecular images objectively? In other words, we, we, we don't want to sort of eyeball these. We want to have a quantitative method. And uh, in 1981, we came out uh, with a method of using multivariate statistical analysis that really essentially is able to uh, do the job uh, in, a, in an exact quantitative way. 
Um, and then computation problem three, is it possible to accurately align molecule images taken with low exposures? Low exposure is the imp important thing because we want to reduce the exposure to such an extent that the molecules that doesn't get damaged. So the question was, how low can we go without losing the ability to align molecules by cross-correlation? And uh, I <clears throat> discovered to, together with Owen Sexton, uh, I discovered a critical uh, criterion uh, that tells us uh, that um, we have to essentially obey uh, the following relationship. The object diameter has to be larger than three over contrast square times the uh, resolution distance that, uh, that we are looking for times the critical dose. Um, and uh, when, when you insert uh, the, the right uh, kinds of numbers, for a ribosome and uh, do the uh, realistic estimation of the contrast in ice um, and also insert the critical dose, then we see that the whole thing really works for resolutions of three angstroms. So that uh, when we discovered this um, relationship, uh, it was essentially a motivation to go ahead. It, it is work, it works even, even if we go to cryo. But cryo methods did not exist at the time. It was just, it was just an, the idea, you know, if we ever were able to um, embed the molecules in, in ice, then, um, then the technique would work. As it, as it happened, um, at the time, we only had uh, negative stain to develop the method, and at the at the very end, when <clears throat> when the first three D reconstructions came out with negative stain, the <clears throat> the cryo methods became available. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then a, a very very important question is um, when it's applied to frozen sample, what's the relationship between the structure of a molecule before and after freezing? Um, well, obviously, if we freeze fast enough, then uh, we see the molecule just at, in the same state as before. But uh, the question is, uh, what happens in between? Is it really fast enough and so forth? I think this is still uh, largely unexamined. Uh, we, we only uh, find out from the, um, from the great success of, the, of, these, um, of this method and the comparison with X-ray structures um, that, that we are really on the, on the, on the right path. <clears throat> um, so vitreous ice embedding came, came along in 1981, and uh, Jacques Dubochet got his um, prize, was a share of the prize for for this development. Uh, I'm also depicting Bob Glaser. He was a mentor of mine for for a one year uh, during my postdoc time in uh, in the U.S. Uh, U.S. Um, I'm de depicting him because he came came up with a method initially. But it it didn't it didn't work, and the reason why it didn't work was was he plunged the crit um, into liquid nitrogen, and that uh, causes the formation of bubbles, uh, and uh, the uh, heat transfer is not fast enough to, to prevent the formation of crystalline ice. So you don't really get a, sp a specimen which preserves the structure of the molecule. And the, and the critical invention by Jacques Dubochet was, was this uh, in-between reservoir of liquid ethane or propane or a mixture of this, which is on the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And uh, <clears throat> this prevents the formation of, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, of crystalline ice. So we, we speak about, about vitreous ice, it is like glass-like and preserves the structure of the molecule as it is in, uh, in uh, at room temperature. <clears throat> so I'm 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 going to guide you 
through, uh, through the experiment. And here we have a, a copper grid, um, which is um, covered with, a, uh, with carbon and the carbon is perforated um, with little holes and you can see, you barely see them. And we get uh, another step of magnification up. Uh, and now we see these holes that are covered, uh, they're covering here. Uh, and the next stage um, is, uh, okay, now we see one of these holes and uh, it, it is now, you know, covered with water and the molecules are swimming in them. And they, you, you, now you imagine they're all moving, they're moving around. Uh, that's sort of the natural movements. Uh, this is actually a realistic movement that we discovered in ribosomes. They, they, they do this kind of ratchet motion uh, under certain conditions. Uh, <clears throat> so, but then uh, it gets plunged into, uh, <clears throat> into the cryogen. And then you can imagine that all motions are exactly frozen at uh, for at, at the time that the molecules is immersed. But what we see uh, in the end in the microscope is really sort of this kind of salt and pepper appearance because uh, we we use low dose, which means that we don't have enough electrons to get clear images. This is the the way the molecules then appear uh, when we when we collect the images um, uh, with, with the camera. And then <clears throat> uh, with, the, with the help of the computer, we can then locate uh, all these different molecules and then put them aside in a gallery. Uh, this here, this gallery is an actual gallery. Everything else before was simulated. So, so these are actually pictures of, of ribosomes. You can see that uh, there's really no way of recognizing uh, any details because it's too noisy. Uh, we have we have too many fluctuations, and obviously we also don't don't know what we're looking in which direction we are looking at. So so then the question is, how do we get from these two D projections to the three D structure they arise from? And more importantly, since since the molecule have uh, uh, are, are undergoing these conformational changes, we want to, want to be able to sort them out uh, immediately into the different structures from where they come from. So this, this is a very, very complicated um, <clears throat> challenge uh, from, from the mathematical point of view. Uh, so, so this is essentially a series of problems that need to be solved, uh, align images, uh, inventory of views. Um, so we need to have some kind of an, a way of doing 2D classification. Now, I already told you align images and 2D classification is possible with this um, cross-correlation and multivariate statistical analysis. Determining viewing direction for each image. Uh, this is now uh, the subject of, the, uh, of these reconstruction schemes um, these are boot, <clears throat> bootstrap reconstruction. And I told you about the one uh, for um, <clears throat> uh, the, um, the, <clears throat> the 3D, uh, uh, the tilt, tilt reconstruction <clears throat> that I was totally telling you about. Then the class, uh, then an, another, another step is to classify uh, by the 3D structure, the image comes, it comes from. And then first, uh, next, after you have done this classification, you do the 3D dimension, uh, 3D uh, dimensional reconstruction for each class. Um, so I, I just very quickly go through these different things, the alignment of single particle projections achieved by cross correlation. This I figured out in my thesis already, 1970, uh, translational cross-correlation, rotational cross-correlation. This can all be done. 
uh, inventory of views, uh, this is done by multivariate statistical analysis, which we published in 1981. Uh, and so this, uh, this can, uh, <clears throat> this is essentially automize, automating uh, what we sort of would do uh, in, in a visual way, but it, it's, it's done in a, in a quantitative way so we can clusters, uh, very clear clusters of images. <clears throat> Here's an example of, uh, of some of the studies in which you see uh, how it nicely um, separates all the different particle views. <clears throat> Determine uh, viewing direction. Well, the other two techniques, bootstrap techniques, one is the random conical reconstruction. And uh, this is what we came up, up with. And then angular reconstitu reconstitution is, is another approach and many of the, of the current uh, determination of viewing direction uh, use this angular reconstitution approach. <clears throat> uh, so this is, this is the random conical reconstruction idea. Uh, it involves uh, taking another uh, <clears throat> view uh, a tilted view of the same uh, of the same uh, field, uh, so we have a, t a zero degree view and a tilted view, and when you analyze this uh, uh, relationship, then you see that the uh, <clears throat> the molecules in the tilted uh, picture uh, essentially form a conical uh, <clears throat> a conical view set. And from that conical view set, one can get the uh, at least the preliminary 3D structure. Uh, classified by 3D structure, uh, this really this problem was solved uh, in a in a general way by Stuart Shears, uh, and uh, there is a, was an initial paper in Nature Methods 2007, and then later. There was an, uh, an, a slightly modified um, a, a approach, which is now incorporated in Rely on and is published in JMB 2012. Now, what it means is that um, e with using these algorithms, we can actually uh, get all the different structures that are coexist in the same sample. And this is an unbelievable realization that this can be done. It can be done, it cannot be done in other techniques. Um, so cryem is unique in being able to get, an, uh, get you an inventory of structures. And this is called story and a sample, okay. <clears throat> uh, and then final 3D reconstruction, I already told you about the, uh, <clears throat> about a foundation uh, of this uh, approach and there are many software packages that um, it, let go from uh, <clears throat> from the projection set to the 3D structure, and they don't take literally this exact approach, but rather do something that is conceptually the same. Um, <clears throat> and I told you already about the pioneering work uh, <clears throat> A, which uses Fourier Bessel approach and requires only a single uh, single projection. Uh, now, I just uh, wanted to uh, <clears throat> tell you about the uh, you know, what it means is <clears throat> um, we can we can uh, ask uh, what's the minimum number of views that we need, and there comes Crowther's formula, which means that. Uh, which says that the number is um, in, a, in a tomographic reconstruction is pi times uh, object diameter divided by the resolution that you want to get out of it. Um, so, uh, and this is for an equidistant uh, uh, geometry. It simply uh, it looks, looks at uh, the necessary information that we get um, from a um, from a single projection and see 
uh, what's the common information that is between the two. And uh, so we wind up with this kind of geometry. Now, if we apply this in the example of a ribosome, <clears throat> it, um, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, um, yeah, at a resolution of uh, 10 angstroms, 10, 10, uh, then we would get, um, yeah, so the 10, 10 angstrom is the real space quantity. Then we, uh, we insert the numbers and get three times 250 divided by 10, which means that we, in theory, 75, Equispace noise free projections are sufficient to reconstruct the 70S ribosome at 1 over 10 uh, at, at uh, 10 angstrom resolution. Uh, so, this is a surprisingly low number. Uh, and, uh, you know, for comparison, I show you. Um, okay, all right, well, this is just in, uh, a restatement of this, of this formula. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, in um, we <clears throat> in the reconstruction that we published in 1995, that was around uh, uh, 25 angstrom resolution, and we we needed uh, a, a, to to get this 2,500 projection. So we need many more even to get 25 angstrom. And the, so the discrepancy between these two different numbers is really uh, because of the extraordinary amount of noise. The, the noise is such that the signal to noise ratio is um, 0.1, which means that the uh, <clears throat> noise content is 10 times larger than the signal contact in such an image. Um, I, I, I just show you an, an example for a story and a sample. Um, and uh, you can see that all these uh, different structures come from the same sample. Uh, it is a study of looking at um, allocation factor G, uh, the way it binds to the ribosome. And we used a mutant of um, EFG a mutant, mutant um, disables the, G, uh, the ability of uh, EFG to produce GDP hydrolysis, so it gets stuck on the ribosome. So he, these are all the images that we obtain uh, from this one study. And it's a beautiful demonstration of story and a sample. And you see this in many, many uh, studies that are done nowadays. Now, uh, one thing that I wanted to um, uh, talk about is um, <clears throat> the resolution definition. Um, <clears throat> the resolution is a reciprocal quantity, which is measured in Fourier space. It is defined as the spatial frequency up to which information is reproducible by some measure of reproducibility. And we do this by decomposition of information in, into Fourier rings. We use randomly picked half sets. For instance, we use reconstructions from odd versus even numbered images. And then we compare the averages or the reconstructions from half sets over rings. So we only compare uh, 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 the, the entire information uh, or that, that is spread out over rings or shells. <clears throat> and uh, and then we we use this formula. So we, uh, the Fourier ring correlation really looks at the contributions to the correlation uh, between the two structures uh, over ring zones. And uh, so it it typically starts with one at very low resolution because a perfect agreement at low resolution, and then it jumps down. Uh, and then <clears throat> we apply a criterion for reproducibility, which is um, FSC is, is uh, 0.5. Uh, a, this was initially used 
uh, we simply say that um, a resolution is defined by the place where the Fourier shell correlation goes below 0.5. And later on, uh, Richard Henderson applied some considerations from X-ray crystallography and came up with the FSC equal to 0.143 criterion, which is nowadays uh, uh, most often used. Um, I'm sorry, um, Ed, uh, was, 10, was it supposed to go to 10.15? Sorry, I'm sorry. I wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions. So you can basically have... I'm sorry? 13, 13 more minutes to go, and then we'll break for questions. Oh, 13. Okay, uh, perfect. Okay, so, <clears throat> but um, uh, there, there has been a lot of contention uh, about uh, reconstruction cr criteria that are defined uh, by these kinds of cutoffs. And um, another approach is to uh, pragmatically uh, define the resolution um, by looking at the visibility of structural elements. Now the structural elements are very, <clears throat> very exactly defined. <clears throat> uh, we know what atoms are, we know what beta sheets are, helices, um, and then uh, <clears throat> we know uh, essentially shapes of domains and so forth. And, and so the, the critical thing here is in order to uh, assess um, whether we see something like um, <clears throat> a beta sheets, heli helices, uh, or, or even side chains. Um, and uh, so with these kinds of practical definitions, one can really talk to each other and, and uh, get, get a consensus of what, what is seen. <clears throat> um, and uh, well, an, an, a very important part of, of, of all these um, reconstruction schemes is an, is an iteration, is an, a, a refinement scheme. So you, will, you, you often hear, well, the, the, the structure refined to something like this. It means that uh, an iterative scheme is used in which uh, predicted uh, projections are, are compared with uh, the experimentally observed ones and new angles are assigned in each cycle. Uh, and here is an, uh, <clears throat> an, a, an example uh, for uh, <clears throat> uh, Paul three uh, at different resolutions. And you can see the sort of the, <clears throat> here the resolution was <clears throat> obtained at 3.9 angstrom, which eventually <clears throat> enabled people to do an uh, an atomic structural modeling. <clears throat> in, the pro in the process of refinement, the Fourier shell correlation uh, gets further and further toward out outward, and then essentially then stabilizes and there's no, no further improvement seen. <clears throat> and that's where the iteration stops. So, <clears throat> you know, essentially, so we have, we have an, a workflow from a sample to the grid, freeze, electron microscope, collect data, pick particles, particle alignment and averaging, a 3D map, and a 3D model. So this is nowadays sort of the, uh, the normal work scheme. <clears throat> I, I just want to show you a case study. Uh, <clears throat> you got involved in the Trypatosoma cruci ribosome along with Mariano Levine. Uh, who was at the Chagas Institute in Buenos Aires. <clears throat> the trypanosome acrusi is the <clears throat> is an um, <clears throat> an organism that causes Chagas disease and is transmitted by beetles. And <clears throat> and we got the first reconstruction in our <clears throat> by by a collaboration with him in two thousand five at 12 angstroms <clears throat> resolution, and it was uh, showed very unusual features, unusual large uh, RNA expansion segments. And then later on, <clears throat> after the introduction of these fantastic 
cameras, the electron detection cameras, uh, we, we revisited Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, and <clears throat> we got in 2016, uh, a 2.5 angstrom resolution from 160,000 particles. Uh, and this is the Zhang Lu uh, did this in my group. And we, uh, the initial data collection was 700,000 particles. And then through 3D classification, it was whittled down to uh, the 174K particles in the case of the large subunit that led us to 2.5 angstrom resolution. <clears throat> and here's this um, reconstruction and uh, it's obviously, it was a huge, huge uh, discovery to be able to uh, find water molecules, uh, ions, um, and uh, and the <clears throat> explicit structure of the uh, of the base pairing, <clears throat> and here are the atomic models <clears throat> that we published. Um, I just wanted to uh, make you aware of the fact that uh, the <clears throat> important contributions of cryoM uh, to the um, <clears throat> uh, to virus structures uh, came came just in time in 2012. Uh, 2012 was the introduction of the of these uh, commercial cameras uh, with the capability of single uh, electron detection, and uh, that uh, this uh, introduction of the camera came just in time. Uh, to enable us to deal with viruses, uh, uh, with pandemics that started uh, here around that time. Uh, there's MERS, Zika, Ebola, Dengue, and now we're still dealing with SARS-CoV-2. So in each of these, if you look at the literature, uh, CryAM has made crucial contributions to the uh, <clears throat> Uh, discovery of structures and also <clears throat> of the uh, <clears throat> of the um, uh, <clears throat> of the way molecules interact uh, with a host. <clears throat> so, uh, just in a nutshell, future direction. Well, not everything is higher spatial resolution. Uh, other directions that are very promising are. Uh, the introduction of time resolution uh, using microfluidics and state resolution. Uh, <clears throat> because if we have very large numbers of molecules, then uh, the chance is that, um, that even very rare states are, are depicted. And what we can do is, is then we can make a, a, a very large data collection uh, in which molecules are depicted in all these different states. And so if we, if we now have a, a mapping that tells us the occupancy of the states, then we can uh, reconstruct the energy landscape. And this is the first time that it's possible to do uh, such a mapping and uh, depict the energy landscape of, the, of a molecule in the, uh, in the normal uh, thermal environment. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> a, a very, very quickly, uh, time-resolved cryoEM, uh, we capture short-lived states in a reaction of two or more components of a machine, of a molecular machine, on the way toward thermal equilibrium. So here we don't start with thermal equilibrium uh, of um, a... Uh, we, we don't start with a stationary uh, distribution, but rather we start with two components and then follow a, a, re a reaction uh, up, to the, up to the end. And then we are interested in any uh, states in between um, that, uh, that are on pathway. <clears throat> State resolution 
we collect many in the hundreds of thousands or millions of snapshots of molecules or molecular machines exhibiting conformational changes in the thermal equilibrium. So here we have to have special equipment for time resolved cryo -EM. Here we don't have to have special equipment. We do standard cryo -EM, but then a deep computational data analysis. Uh, so going through this here, um, you know, this is the, sort of the concept that I already depicted. Um, and uh, yeah, schematically, we have solution one, solution two. We have a mixer uh, that mixes within uh, 0.5 millisecond. And then we have a reaction uh, cha channel that has different lengths for different time uh, ranges. Um, and then in the end, uh, with the help of the driving gas, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the product is sprayed onto the grid as the grid falls down into the cryogen. Okay, so this, this is the way such an apparatus looks. And uh, now we have um, no longer a, a single chip, but, an, but three different components that are <clears throat> that are separate and they are modular. So with it, with it, a, and, and it uses not silicon, but but a uh, but a plastic PDMS uh, plastic. So we have a a, <clears throat> a micro mixer, a tubing which has different lengths for different reaction time, and then a micro sprayer. And this is all done with, by Chang Song Feng. Uh, in my lab and um, K. Lin in, uh, in the engineering uh, <clears throat> department. Uh, and here I, I just show you an, uh, a most recent example uh, of, an <clears throat> of such a short-lived state that we captured for the first time. Uh, so it was without any intervention uh, any chemical intervention or use of, of mutants. So this is the actual uh, and actually trapped state on the way to equilibrium. Uh, <clears throat> um, and then, <clears throat> and then. Uh, the capture of states, um, we can, uh, I, I have to do this very quickly only, uh, what's the principle? Well, in every single projection direction, you can think of having a, a whole variety of conformations of the molecule. And we simply examine only the ones in one particular direction. And then we do this separately for all the different ones and then reconcile the results. So then we can get a mapping uh, of, the, of the conformation states. <clears throat> and uh, here's an application to the uh, virus spike protein. Uh, so here, the idea is really, uh, I, can, I, can, I can explain this the best by uh, 10,000 horses galloping. I found this image is somewhere in China. Uh, <clears throat> so they're all galloping. In, in, a, in a particular direction. And uh, <clears throat> um, you, can, you can now look at this, take a snapshot, and then find out whether you can order the images in the, um, <clears throat> uh, in the sequence uh, of, the, of the galloping uh, posture. So if we do this, uh, then you can really reconstruct uh, a complete sequence of a, of a galloping horse. So this is the same principle. And we applied this here for molecules and developed an entire uh, suite of, of software that makes this possible. And here in, in this case, it has been applied to uh, the uh, virus spike structure. And it shows that the uh, uh, that one of the domains uh, goes 
into an active state from an from an inactive state. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is my final slide. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make clear that the future development there is more than better spatial resolution. There are very interesting um, developments. And there may be more errors, but these are the ones that uh, are of particular interest to me um, uh, right now. Okay, so so with this, I just uh, want to leave you with a lot, with a lot of thoughts, and um, I hope we have a, a discussion. <clears throat> we'll see how the sound pickup is. I'll ask the first question and open the floor for questions afterwards. You worked on Spider, which was one of the, the initial seminal data processing software packages. And without the assistance of automation and using software, it would be really hard to make a lot of headway in single particle analysis. So how was your process with creating Spider and how did that come about? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. <clears throat> it was... Um, because the initial concepts involved so many steps that had never been explored. Um, and uh, it, it involved uh, software solutions um, that all had to be independently uh, worked on. Uh, it, it was no longer possible to simply make, make a very large program and make it larger and larger each time you get a new idea. But uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's how I came up with the idea of a modular system in which uh, any anything uh, that could be solved was simply solved and and put into uh, and you know in in a, in a separate bin it's already a solved problem so so we have many many modules of <clears throat> of standard operations such as Fourier transform and autocorrelation, cross-correlation, shifting, and so forth. So you can think of this as an as an sort of a legal uh, 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 set uh, where you put the different components together. Uh, and so you can program, uh, but the programming is on, on a higher level. Uh, so you, I had to develop a script language that make it possible to build anything up that, that I wanted. And that's, it was really, that design was crucial for making rapid process uh, in, in all this initially. Now, and, and, and this system had, had uh, the advantage that you could really, that anybody could participate in development and could also uh, grasp a certain concepts simply by applying the modules to certain um, a certain image sets and see what the outcome was. Nowadays, this is no longer possible. Uh, nowadays, we are dealing with black boxes. You you don't you don't know what they what's what's going on inside. You have to trust the developers. And um, what's what's missing? What 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 got missing is is the is some kind of a conceptual understanding of what what each step is doing. <clears throat> Hi, Frank. Um, thanks for the, the talk. Um, I have one question. I guess it's a technical question, but one of the slides that you have, you showed an FSC curve. And when it's sort of going down at about 0.25, and then it show a backup um, um, at the 0.35, and then it start going down again. So my question is that why, why does it have this sort of lump? Oh, that that can have <clears throat> that can have um, a lot of different um, sources. It, it could be <clears throat> it could be that um, you have uh, you have certain structural features that are uh, underrepresented. Uh, you can have uh, <clears throat> you can have an, um, a failure to correctly um, uh, to to correct for the CTF um, and. Uh, there's there, there there so many different 
uh, uh, causes. What, when it becomes interesting is, of course, when when the curve goes down, you know, to zero and then go, goes up again, and so you have two resolutions that you could quote, and you know, it will really be really be honest to 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 quote the 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 lower resolution then because you really have a, a gap in information. <clears throat> Um, one one thing that interests me is that you know you, you show a um, uh, a two D average on a particle, and I sort of almost always struggle to if if it's a new structure, I, I always struggle to choose how to think which which particle to choose. So do you have any sort of recommendation on which particle to choose, or which particle to choose? Well. <sighs> You know, nowadays, nowadays there there are you know very complex practices being used. I'm I'm not following what what is exactly done. I I I feel like I cannot I cannot give you a very very constructive answer there uh, because there are you know criteria used uh, that that are uh, you know part of of the whole. Um, <clears throat> A part of the whole software solution. <clears throat> Follow up on a, a question. So, Joachim, you're talking about when you have heterogeneity, and that could actually be very biochemically relevant. So, how do you deal with multitude of states or a continuum of states in your data? For a what? If you have a continuum of states yeah. or a lot of different states in your sample, which may be heterogeneity, but actually is biochemically helpful or relevant. Right, but I, you know, all you can do is reconstruct and then and then find out how they are um, related to one another. I, it's, it's really not a question about the practice of cryo-EM, but rather of, of interpretation. Interested what uh, the recent developments in this uh, dynamic uh, cryo EM is, which captures basically um, dynamic processes. So it seems like that there are some limitations which time scales the processes have, as you often study, because some of the different approaches use, like, for example, uh, the punch freezing and so on. So what are some current approaches to extend the time scales to include more different processes? Um, well, there is uh, <clears throat> there's really a limitation because one one cannot we cannot, for instance, capture transition states and so forth. One cannot see the molecules in in essentially doing doing their work. One can only see the um, Short-lived states, which are long-lived enough uh, to uh, to generate, uh, a, a, you know, multiplicity. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we can, with 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 cryem, we probably uh, can barely go into uh, sub millisecond. Uh, <clears throat> maybe maybe it it will be possible at some time to go to. 500 microseconds or so, <clears throat> but uh, there, there is really nothing that can be done to get to get shorter. <clears throat> so very often I'm asked, you know, what, how does it compare with the with the work that you can do with with um, uh, <clears throat> electron free laser? Um, uh, you know, we we are in a completely different time range here. Hi, uh, you showed Crowd uh, Crowder's formula earlier where there was a theor theoretical amount of images that you could use to reach a certain resolution. However, um, you know, looking at current data sets, typically thousands, hundreds of thousands of images might be used to reach a certain resolution. Uh, what do you think is the limit of, what do you think is the informational content that's 
present within a single Crowe EM particle image right now. And do you think processing algorithms have been able to fully utilize all of that content to uh, interpret models? Well, um, <clears throat> as I tried to point out, the, um, without, without averaging, uh, you simply, you cannot exhaust the, the information contents that would be theoretically there uh, because um, statistically you don't you don't have enough information in there, uh, so you you absolutely need to to average. Uh, you you cannot simply look at a, at a single image and and try uh, try to uh, try to extract extract information in the in the presence of noise. You you then you would you would need to. Um, to get the information from somewhere else, you you, you might go go to a PDB, and and say, well, this is probably similar to this in this structure. And then, uh, you know, with this kind of what I call cheating, you you would get something out of there, but but you really put would put a lot of information in, and and I'm a believer in in doing the uh, these things completely cleanly and not not going in. With um, uh, with with some existing knowledge uh, to solve a structure, and that's also one of my main criticism of AlphaFold. You know, AlphaFold, you know, uses this immense accumulation of knowledge that comes from somewhere else, and then on the basis of this, it's it's doing a a, a structural prediction. Uh, but uh, but this is really you know, if you go on like this, then it simply means that the structural universe is restricted to the universe that was already there before. And, and you have a very big gap somewhere else because there is no training set available. <clears throat> Hopefully you're not getting dizzy. All right, thank you for the talk. Uh, I had a question about the resolution or the signal to noise uh, limit. You were mentioning it's 0.1, 90% of it is noise, 10% is signal. Uh, have we reached that limit? Can we improve the signal to noise ratio by hardware or software means, or is that the limit? Oh, you mean, you mean to improve the signal to noise ratio in the collection of data? Yes. Or, or what? Uh, be, because you always hardware or software, yeah. Well, no, no, no. Software is, is <laughs> so software okay, means, is means that they use averaging. So you know that's already there. But um, when you say hardware, then you mean then you mean somehow uh, get a get a better signal to noise ratio. But that, but that's that's forbidden uh, because of the uh, low dose. Uh, you know, so the low dose gives you give you a certain amount of shot noise, which just happens to be so large. Uh, most of the uh, noise part of the signal to noise ratio is really coming from shot noise. So there is no way uh, around it. Okay, Joachim, thank you very much for your lecture. I, the sound pickup is horrible, but you'll be hearing a lot of clapping if you were here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there are any pertinent questions, just just um, just send me an email. Okay. Right. Good luck with the course. <laughs>